Um, so welcome. Um, I am going to say a little bit about myself before I get started. I'm an artist myself, and I um, have taught art to everything from kindergartners to senior citizens, and uh, I specialize in art history, and I've been doing these programs now for about 10 years at various libraries, senior centers, women's groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, this is part of a, a series of talks I'm doing on marginalized populations, uh, but it's really perfect uh, for Pride Month, so I'm very happy to be presenting that. And uh, let's get started. Um, so before I go into individual artists, I just want to make a point that um, there's been a very different attitude, obviously, over the years um, toward uh, people with non-traditional uh, gender roles. And um, there's been, uh, for most of that history, uh, people were really in peril in a lot of ways, um, certainly uh, to get their art accepted, but even to the point of being arrested or even put to death at certain periods in history. So some, uh, for most of history, these, um, LGBTQ artists really were not uh, out. They were not um, open about their preferences. And uh, they, uh, you know, a lot of this we know um, through various clues that have to do with their art, sometimes writings. Um, so I'm just gonna be touching on a few of uh, Renaissance era and Baroque era artists. Um, but uh, the majority of this will be artists in the uh, 20th century. So um, the first artist we're gonna look at is one of the most famous of all time, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo was one of 12 siblings. Uh, he was um, illegitimate, but never really treated um, in any negative way because of that. Um, and uh, he became one of the most influential geniuses really of all time. Um, so uh, this is a work he did in 1485. Um, before we get to that though, uh, Leonardo in uh, 1476, when he was uh, in his twenties, he was accused of sodomy with three other men. Um, he uh, did not, uh, you know, get, uh, uh, investigated too much for this. He was acquitted because uh, he was friends with some very influential families. Um, at the time, homosexuality was illegal. Uh, punishment was imprisonment, humiliation, but also sometimes death. Um, this was very traumatic to Leonardo and for the rest of his life, he kept a fairly low profile about his sexuality. Uh, he also did move to Milan, which may have been um, uh, provoked by this incident. Uh, so let's look at some of his important works. Uh, this is by Truvian Man. Um, it's really a, a classic work of the Renaissance because it combines a lot of the ideas. Um, first of all, it is based on a Roman architect by Truvius. So it is harking back to classical times, which the Renaissance was really all about. Um, it's a um, combination of ideas of science, of uh, design, of art, um, and certainly architecture was very involved in this. The idea of proportion, very important to architecture. And um, it, the Renaissance was all about sort of a man in his, the humanism, the importance of man and his relation to nature, uh, the link between the earthly, which is represented by the square here, and the divine, which is represented by the circle. And um, uh, many other artists tried to put this sort of concept into visual form, um, but Leonardo was the most successful at it. Uh, this is a sketch, actually, a cartoon, it was called, uh, for a painting, A Virgin Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist. 
Um, it's done in various uh, types of chalk um, and a beautiful representation of the, the figures and the faces, um, a lot of uh, psychological insight in the way the, uh, the expressions are shown here. And uh, again, compositionally really um, interesting how everything sort of uh, draws your eye toward the center or the focal point of price there. Uh, so this was actually just meant as a sketch, but it is uh, a beautiful work of art in its own right. Uh, so let's turn to Michelangelo. Um, and Michelangelo had a relationship, um, not until he was in his 50s, he started a relationship with an Italian nobleman who was quite a bit younger, named Tommaso de Cavalieri. Um, and he remained a friend of Michelangelo uh, for the rest of his life. And Michelangelo lived a very long life. He was 89 when he died. Um, the affair um, uh, provoked uh, Michelangelo to write a great deal of poetry, homoerotic poetry, that was not published till after his death. And actually, his grandnephew, to um, sort of disguise the homosexual content, changed the gender uh, pronouns in the poetry. Um, and uh, a lot of his artwork, just uh, certain elements of it have also given rise to the idea of him being gay. And um, we'll talk about that a little later. First of all, let's look at the Pieta. Uh, this is a work that Michelangelo did at the age of 24. Uh, one of his most famous, um, most beautiful um, sculptures um, a, a great deal of emotional content again. Um, he's doing something very difficult here and having the, um, the adult body of Christ somehow um, being comforted by this female figure of Mary. Um, and uh, one of the ways he's making this work is these voluminous skirts that she has that is sort of providing a base for the sculpture. Uh, he's also presenting um, Mary as a quite a young woman. And this uh, piece was actually criticized because they felt that she was too young to be his mother. Um, and the way Michelangelo responded to that was that her purity is what kept her so young. Uh, it also is the only sculpture that Michelangelo ever signed. And there's a band across her chest that has his name on it. And I think at this early part in his career, he wanted to make sure he was gonna get credit for uh, work. Uh, so this is part of the Sistine Chapel. And you see these nude figures known as Ignudo um, that are uh, sort of connecting elements of the different scenes in the Sistine Chapel. Um, he does something really extraordinary here. Um, using this, what's known as fictive architecture, or, um, you know, it's a trompe loy kind of idea to separate these scenes and um, make it convincing when looked at from below. Um, so you see these figures um, and, uh, you know, certainly a, a great deal of attention to the, uh, the male bodies here. Um, now, this is one of the things that have, has led people to presume that Michelangelo was gay, um, is the masculinity of his female figures. Uh, so this is one of his most beautiful um, uh, figures. This is the Libyan Sybil, and uh, just an incredible amount of gracefulness to that position, that sort of gentle like curve of the body, um, which is probably a very sort of uncomfortable position, but somehow he makes it look very elegant. Um, but it is a very masculine looking body, very broad shoulders, very muscular arms. Um, and there's been a lot of explanations for that. Um, one, there was probably a shortage of females to pose for these works. Um, also, the fact is that these androgynous type bodies were thought to be very beautiful during this time period. 
And um, another idea that was common in the Renaissance is that the, the real normative kind of human body was male and the female body was sort of a, an imperfect uh, copy of that. Uh, so uh, those are some of the ideas. Um, you can sort of form your own conclusion about that. Um, but it does definitely follow that his females are, uh, have very masculine bodies. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so let's move on to Caravaggio. This is an Italian Baroque painter of the early 17th century. Uh, ver known very much for his uh, lifestyle. He was a very violent man. Um, he lived going you know, in and out of taverns. He was actually accused of murder at one point um, and only lived till about the age of 39, uh, but incredibly influential artist. Um, he never married or had children and um, uh, created a lot of very sensual um, images of young men in his work. Um, this is a religious painting. This is in the Contarelli Chapel and uh, very uh, typical of the things that make Caravaggio so important as an artist. Um, this is a very extreme use of light and dark. Um, it's very kind of theatrical. Um, I, once read that the, uh, the film director Martin Scorsese um, was very influenced by the lighting in Caravaggio's paintings and has sort of tried to reproduce some of these feelings in his, his films. Um, so this is a uh, portrait of Christ calling uh, St. Matthew to be one of his disciples. And um, you can't really see uh, very clearly, but there is a very thin um, halo over the head of Christ. Uh, he's using a gesture which actually comes right out of Sistine Chapel, the creation of Adam, uh, that hand gesture. And he's pointing to Matthew here. Um, so this is a biblical scene, but yet it is taking place in a modern day, in a contemporary um, 17th century or very late 16th century uh, tavern in Rome uh, and uh, kind of a, a sleazy kind of environment. Um, because of this, this painting was really considered somewhat blasphemous. He was really kind of um, uh, riding a very uh, touchy line uh, with the way he was depicting these biblical scenes. Uh, this is called Boy Bitten by Lizard. And uh, we have a young boy here, and you see the same model in many, many of Caravaggio's works. Um, so this is a secular painting. There's no re uh, religious content here. Uh, he's reaching for some fruit on the table and is bitten by a lizard. Um, in uh, Italian uh, street slang of the time, bitten fingers represented a wounded phallus. And he's also including Jasmine in the picture, which signifies sexual desire. So the, the message here is that temptation, that indulging in, in sexual appetite is a dangerous uh, uh, procedure. Um, so let's move on uh, quite a bit to uh, Rosa Bonheur, um, who was a painter in the realist school in the 19th century. And um, she, had, she was quite uh, ahead of her time. Uh, she lived her life in a same-sex partnership. Uh, she was very devoted to animals who became her uh, typical subject matter. She never wore female attire. She also smoked, which was quite uh, shocking at the time. Uh, so here's some of her work, uh, very realistic. Um, as you see, she knew a lot about animals and the anatomy. She spent a lot of time uh, studying this. Um, and uh, sort of, a, this is a celebration of peasant life and work. And um, this was a time when things were changing very much in France and those things were becoming more urbanized and there was the industrial revolution. And um, this is sort of holding on to um, the, the past, the agricultural past. 
best for the country. And this is a portrait you did of William Cody, and uh, he did tours of Europe uh, showing off a, uh, sort of this cowboy lifestyle. And here you see him and his horse and um, a very accurate representations of the animal's anatomy. Uh, the next artist is named Gustav Kailabot. Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he was associated with the Impressionists, um, though he, his work is really not that typical um, in a lot of, of aspects. Um, but um, he, uh, he, as I said, was friends with a lot of the Impressionists. He was a wealthy man who uh, supported many of them as well. Um, let's look. This is a work by him uh, called The Floor Scrapers. Um, and it's showing uh, common workmen, um, you know, doing their labor, uh, you know, definitely um, uh, emphasizing the muscularity of the bodies here. Um, the salon at the time refused the painting. They considered it uh, very vulgar um, to show these sort of uh, common uh, lower class people as the center of these this painting. Um, it's also notable for sort of this high vantage point, sort of unusual perspective. Um, this is something that uh, Kyle Butt got from Japanese printmaking, which was influential to many of the Impressionists and post-Impressionists. Um, this is another very famous painting by him um, showing the streets of Paris. Uh, this was a time after um, the, uh, the cityscape was sort of redesigned by someone named Baron Haussmann, uh, opening up these grand boulevards and, uh, and squares. And uh, this is showing a variety of different classes are mingling on the street. A uh, very modern scene, and um, it has a very kind of strange perspective, uh, sort of going up and then and then down again, almost like a, a roller coaster. And uh, this is called "Man at His Bath." Um, this was um, not uh, exhibited till. Uh, I think uh, after his death, uh, showing um, man in, in a very typical way that women would be shown. If you think of Degas' uh, bathers or Cezanne's bathers, um, but something very unusual at the time to show a, a nude man in this setting, uh, sort of the, the female gaze rather than the male gaze. Um, and uh, this uh, was recently uh, purchased by the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston for $17 million. Uh, so let's turn to Aubrey Beardsley. Um, he was a very controversial artist. Um, he was associated with the Art Nouveau movement, with symbolism, with something called uh, aestheticism. Um, he worked as an illustrator um, and he was very critical of repressive Victorian ideas, uh, specifically about uh, sexuality and gender roles. Uh, this is uh, one of his most famous illustrations for Oscar Wilde's Salome. And uh, you have this figure wrapped in a, a skirt. Um, so you have uh, Salome kind of uh, looming over this man, um, and uh, it's they're very it's very androgynous figures. So you have the uh, the very feminine looking man, but if you look at his legs, they're very masculine. Um, and uh, this is very typical of Art Nouveau with these sort of sinuous lines, a uh, beautiful um, representation of. Um, of these costumes and these uh, elements. And um, 
this was um, an illustration for an Edgar Allan Poe and uh, his stories fit in very well with these uh, symbolists and decadent ideas. Uh, they were sort of fascinated by the ghoulish nature of them. And um, let's see, oh yeah, sorry about that. I thought I had something else. Um, Sorry. Okay, John Singer Sargent. Um, he was the premier portraitist of his generations, um, mainly painting society figures in Paris, London, and New York, and um, very much influenced by older painters like Anthony Van Dyck and Diego Velazquez, um, but also influenced by the Impressionists. Sometimes he is called a um, an American Impressionist. Um, so he was American, though really didn't live much of his life uh, in the United States. Uh, so let's look at some of his uh, work. There's been a lot of speculation about his sexual proclivities. Um, he never married, um, but he kept things pretty hidden. He did have a very close relationship with Henry James. Uh, this is one of his most famous works. It's at the Met. Um, and it's known as Madame X. Uh, it's a portrait of a society woman, uh, also an American, but was living in Paris. And her name was Virginia Gatreau. Um, and her husband uh, was a wealthy Frenchman hired sergeant to do this painting. Uh, things didn't go very well. Uh, when it was first exhibited, one of the straps on her gown was hanging off her shoulder. Uh, for this reason and some others, this was considered vulgar and scandalous, and um, it, it affected not only Sargent's reputation, uh, he at this point um, left Paris and went to London to continue his career, but it also affected her reputation, and uh, she was uh, considered, um, you know, very scandalous because of this. And, uh, the, for that reason, uh, he decided to call it Madame X, not to have it associated with her name. Um, though he did say that this was probably the best painting he ever did. Uh, this is another uh, portrait of Carl Meyer and um, uh, her children. This was done in Great Britain. And um, you see uh, very, uh, beautifully painted uh, figures. Um, the children are kind of hidden partially behind the couch there. Um, and the emphasis is definitely on, uh, on the woman and her beautiful dress. And then we have um, these uh, pictures that he made later in his life, uh, mostly not exhibited in his lifetime. And uh, this is his favorite model, his name Thomas McKellar, uh, a black man, an elevator operator in a Boston hotel. And um, he uh, paints him quite a bit. And uh, these, um, you know, sort of indicate a relationship between these two men. Uh, so let's go to Marsden Hartley. Um, he's an artist who's associated with um, a group of painters that were um, affiliated with the photographer Al Alfred Stieglitz and his gallery, uh, including his wife, Georgia O'Keeffe, Arthur Dove, Charles DeMuth, and John Marin. And um, here's uh, some of his work. Um, so uh, using very uh, strong color, very simplified forms here, um, there is um, this painting here uh, that is uh, a sort of homage to his lover. Um, it was a German man named Karl von Freiburg, uh, died in battle in World War I. And this painting was meant to commemorate them. Uh, so uh, done mainly in symbols and shapes, uh, but definitely meant to, uh, to make reference to this man. 
Um, Harley's career was somewhat affected by his refusal to denounce Germany. Um, and uh, this made him very controversial in the United States. Uh, so this is a later painting by Hartley. It's uh, kind of a strange uh, concept because it's all, calling this man a lumberjack. Um, usually you would imagine him wearing a flannel shirt, uh, but here he's on the beach in Maine um, and uh, is a very muscular body. Uh, Charles de Muth, uh, who I just mentioned, part of that other um, group of painters, the Stieglitz, um, but he was also a member of a movement known as the Precisionists. Uh, they emphasized very sharp lines, geometric forms, and um, he, uh, he presented this, um, these kind of paintings uh, that are, this one's showing a grain elevator in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, he's using these sort of intersecting beams of light, sort of fracturing the forms, uh, certainly reflecting an interest in cubism. Um, but he's also sort of making reference to the pyramids of Egypt, and that's uh, what the title is alluding to. Um, so sort of the, um, uh, the industrial landscape of America as a comparison with that, and um, perhaps the, the slave labor that was used to build those, uh, those civilizations. Uh, this is a watercolor sketch uh, by DeMuth, um, and uh, again, something that probably was not exhibited during his lifetime, uh, showing him in a, a bath. Um, and this is in 1918. Um, they think it's a, a place called the Lafayette Baths in the East Village. Um, and the artist uh, with the, the mustache in the center um, is shown there. So very much ahead of its time to show this and really was not, as I said, not very well known um, exhibited then. Uh, so now we turn to a British artist, Francis Bacon. Um, some very, very powerful images of uh, traumatized humanity in uh, post-war art. Uh, inspirations from various sources, surrealism, photography, the old masters, um, mainly working on portraiture. Um, and uh, we have here uh, one of his most famous images. Uh, it's definitely based on a Velasquez painting of Pope Innocent. Uh, he did a whole series called The Screaming Popes. Uh, so he's sort of uh, illustrating sort of the angst and the horror at what man was capable of, especially after World War II and the Holocaust. Um, and uh, you see this figure um, with sort of stripes almost like a jail cell around him at the cage. Um, so this is a somewhat more graphic imagery. This is called Two Figures, uh, Two Men in the Act of Love. Um, uh, it is believed that uh, Bacon was actually a masochist. Um, and he also um, was brought up in a very abusive family. And um, in his 60s, he met this man, George Dyer, who was quite a bit younger. And um, there's uh, a relationship between them. Uh, Dyer was a very troubled man. He was addicted to drugs and alcohol and um, you see him sort of looking down into an abyss here. Uh, now we turn to Robert Rauschenberg. Um, and uh, he was sort of the movement after abstract expressionism. And he did these um, uh, compositions known as combines. And he's combining various elements here. Uh, there's sort of an apocryphal tale that he painted this bed when he ran out of canvas and just took off his bedding to paint 
Um, and he's combining various objects together and letting the viewers sort of make their own meaning from that. Um, and here's one called Canyon. Um, this includes an eagle um, and uh, apparently um, he, uh, he used this eagle, it was like shortly before there was a law that you couldn't damage the bald eagle. There was a protect protection act. Uh, so he made it clear that uh, he didn't uh, break any rules by doing this. Um, so uh, as I said, he's using these various um, these various elements in combination here, including text as well. Um, Rauschenberg also was um, connected with Jasper Johns um, and they became partners um, and they were also friends with uh, two other very uh, important avant-garde uh, artists, uh, John Cage, the composer, and Merce Cunningham, uh, the choreographer, and uh, they uh, collaborated on many works. Uh, the next artist we're going to look at is Diane Arbus, a photographer, and uh, she really um, specialized in painting, uh, I'm sorry, in photographing sort of marginalized populations, uh, circus freaks, midgets, giants, and uh, gender non-conforming people as well. Uh, these were subjects that had rarely been in front of a camera before. Um, this is uh, called Miss Venice Beach, uh, showing uh, the object of the gaze as well as the gazers uh, in the foreground here. Um, so uh, she's observing these, uh, these people from very close up, uh, very kind of unsparing. She was kind of a genius at warming her way into situations with people that um, normally would not be photographed at all. Um, here's one uh, called a naked man being a woman. And you see uh, that sort of gender uh, uh, ambiguity showing here, um, but also making reference to this sort of contrapposto pose that you see in uh, Renaissance art. Uh, Beaufort Delaney, an uh, artist that was associated with the Harlem Renaissance, um, and uh, he, uh, he worked with portraiture, uh, city scenes, and abstraction, um, and a lot of his work kind of rides the, the, um, uh, the fence between those various things. Let's see, uh, very influenced by jazz. Um, and uh, the um, idea of music finds its way into much of his work. Uh, he was also very good friends with James Baldwin. Um, they shared um, the experience of being uh, gay African-Americans in this time period. And um, this is a portrait of him. Uh, so he, this is Jasper Johns, and uh, he is someone who is associated with the pop art movement. Uh, he is using common objects, uh, flags, and targets quite often. Uh, this was this uh, movement that was making a comment on the commercialization of American life, uh, the influence of advertising and things like that, um, and also kind of... Um, rebelling against the abstract movement that came before. Um, so uh, he's using these flags. He said, um, these are things the mind already knows, but he is uh, showing them in a very different way. He's using a, a very old method known as encaustic, uh, which is mixing molten wax with pigment and creating this very uh, dimensional surface. Uh, he's often painting on top of uh, layers of newspaper. Uh, sometimes the text shows through. Uh, so he is, uh, he was once asked if the work was a painted flag or a flag painting. And he responded that it was both. 
um, this is called false start. Um, so you see all these uh, names of colors. Uh, so the text is included, um, but quite often the color and the word are uh, contradictory to each other. Uh, sort of exploring the whole idea of symbols and words and, and uh, uh, the importance of images like this. Um, so let's turn to Andy Warhol, um, started out as a commercial artist and um, he is also considered part of this pop art movement. Uh, so the Campbell soup cans are probably his most famous images. Uh, again, sort of comments on the uh, commodity nature of American life at this time. Um, and he's using a technique um, called silk screen uh, to sort of make multiple copies of these, of these images. Um, and this is, um, an image he did of Marilyn Monroe. So he's also um, combining the, the idea of celebrity and um, making celebrities into almost religious figures. So um, this was shortly after Monroe's suicide and he's surrounding her with gold, very similar to the way you would see a figure in a, a Byzantine icon um, and uh, just, uh, showing sort of the um, the different importance that these uh, celebrities had sort of outsized importance in American culture. And uh, he also uh, painted him, uh, photographed himself here and um, did many, many versions of various celebrities um, in this style. Uh, so turn to David Hockney, a British uh, painter, uh, came to America at a fairly young age and um, uh, worked out of California. Uh, his work is very associated with that. Um, and uh, he is also, uh, he's doing figurative painting, uh, sort of revived figurative painting at the time. Um, but he's also combining that um, with advertising images and also ideas about cubism. Uh, so this is one of his most famous works. Uh, he was still a student at uh, UC Berkeley at the time. And uh, it's a very quintessential uh, California painting. Um, he's showing sort of that moment of the splash, sort of implying um, there's a human there without actually showing the human. Uh, he commented that he, he loved the idea of painting something for two weeks that uh, took place at about two seconds. And uh, some of his later works, really interesting. Here we have two um, vanishing points, uh, something that you don't see. You know, the, the idea of one vanishing point has been a standard for uh, landscape painting since the Renaissance. And uh, you get this sort of um, surreal view, especially uh, with the exaggerated colors here. And this actually goes on a lot for about 15 canvases. Um, so there are various um, uh, uh, sections of this that you can see. Uh, the next artist we're gonna look at is Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, he was an artist uh, popular in the 80s. Um, and he was known for installations that have this very simple but powerful impact, uh, making statements about uh, his personal life and specifically about the AIDS crisis. Um, this one is called Lover Boy, and it's showing these curtains. Um, that are uh, hanging in front of windows, um, sort of evoking a place where people live without anyone actually being there. Uh, ideas of sort of sudden uh, exits um, and uh, has to do with his, um, the death of his longtime lover. 
and another one, this is called Portrait of Ross, and it's a, a pile of candies. Um, the weight of all of these when it's um, full, uh, the full installation is 175 pounds, which was the healthy weight of Ross, uh, his lover, um, before he got HIV. Um, the viewers uh, invited to take the candies, so they are gradually reducing the size of this pile, uh, sort of making them uh, complicit in the whole idea of uh, the disappearing of this, uh, this figure in his life. Um, and of course, there were a lot of people complicit in ignoring uh, the AIDS crisis for a long time. Uh, Robert Maplethorpe, um, very important photographer, um, erotic photography, um, uh, pictures of fetishism and uh, leather world. Um, and uh, he is very formal in his approach to photography. Um, this one is of Lisa Lyon, um, a female bodybuilder. Uh, again, someone who's sort of bridging that that gap between um, male and female representation. Um, also, her her face is shielded from. Uh, I mean, we can gaze at her, but she really can't see us at this time. Uh, and she was one of the favorite models of Mamthor. Um this is a double portrait of uh, two bald men, a black man and a white man. And he's really playing up the contrast between their skin tones and uh, the sort of stu structural, sculptural nature of their bodies. Uh, so now let's go to Keith Haring. Um, he, uh, was popular in the 80s uh, primarily, um, sort of bridging the gap between high art and low art, uh, certainly influenced by graffiti art that was um, all around New York City, um, but definitely touching on social issues, uh, making lots of statements, and creating a kind of um, iconography with his work as sort of this language of images and symbols. Um, and he was definitely important as an activist. Uh, this uh, heart love motif um, is repeated many times and showing uh, two men in love, uh, you know, uh, very important to the, uh, the gay movement. I did lots of murals, um, lots of uh, things to help out various communities and uh, made statements about drug use and uh, certainly about the AIDS crisis. Uh, and here's uh, one of those. This is showing that idea of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, um, which uh, is very apropos of the, um, the attitude of many people toward this crisis that caused the deaths of many people, uh, including uh, Herring when he was 31 years old. Uh, there's another photographer, Annie Leibovitz, um, who has uh, sort of celebrated and criticized celebrity culture in her work, uh, sort of bridging the gap between fine art and commercial art, um, and a very interesting um, sort of narrative approach to some of her work. Uh, this is a portrait of John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Um, initially, Leibovitz wanted this to be a double uh, nude portrait, both of them nude together. Um, but Ono at the time refused to remove her clothes, um, which is uh, sort of the opposite image to a lot of the uh, famous art historical images that show nude women and clothed men. Um, and uh, this sort of subverts that idea. Um, tragically, this was uh, photographed only a few hours where John Lennon was shot and killed. Um, 
this uh, is key pairing as a subject here. Uh, the brilliant photograph, I think, using the whole environment uh, and his body uh, to uh, showcase his style. And this is a famous portrait that was a cover of um, Vanity Fair. Um, very unusual to show a nude pregnant woman like this, and uh, especially somebody famous like her. Uh, and many people refused to display this and uh, covered it up as if it was pornography. Uh, Catherine Opie, a photographer um, popular in the 90s. Um, uh, uh, most of the portraits were of her peers, uh, lesbian, queer, BDSM, and leather communities in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And um, here's one showing her um, uh, staring right back at us, um, wearing what she called an expression of a serial killer from the Midwest. Um, and uh, she is, uh, disguising herself here with signs of masculinity, like the mustache. Uh, this is a self-portrait of her nursing her child. And uh, we have this sort of background of red and gold, which is reminiscent of Renaissance portraits. Um, but, you know, the, the tattoos and the sort of butch uh, portrayal of the woman is certainly different than you've seen. And uh, the last artist we're going to look at is David Wojnarowicz. Um, and again, very political work, uh, very much uh, associated with the AIDS epidemic. Um, and he went through a lot of trauma in his life, uh, child abuse, homelessness, and prostitution. And um, this is one of his works, including um, himself in a school picture, and includes a lot of texts that he wrote as well, uh, talking about how this child will grow up and um, have many challenges as a homosexual. Um, and it, he states that it will all happen because he desires to place his na naked body on the body of another boy. And uh, this is uh, very tragic, showing his friend Peter Hujar uh, immediately after his death uh, from AIDS. Um, and uh, Wojnarowicz took a number of photographs at that time. Uh, really, you know, a lot of um, anger and trying to raise awareness uh, about this epidemic. And uh, Wojnarowicz died also shortly. Uh, so I'm going to end there and uh, be happy to take any questions at this time. If anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to chime in. Uh, unmute yourself if you'd like, put, put it in the chat and I can relay it if you're more comfortable with that. Um, I will just say looking at this image, um, I went to the David Wanarovic show at the Whitney, I believe, uh -huh. a few years back. And this series was such a radical thing um, uh, because I think he just really wanted people to see what, what was actually happening. Um, right. It's jarring. It's very jarring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very moving, very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments or? A couple of comments in the chat I saw. Yes. Yes, I see. Excellent presentation. Thank you. This <laughs> was great. Thank you so much. Thank you um, all for having me here. And, uh, oh, I'm so glad that you could be the kickoff good. to my Pride Month events. Please come to the others. We've got a lot of really interesting, varied things going on. So, um, 
you know, and if there are no questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, hope yes. to do it again. Soon. Yes, we will. <laughs>